Okay, so we are going to talk about uh, the French and Indian War, and I'm going to figure out how to make this go. Okay, so we're going to talk about the French and Indian War, and these will be a series of about 15 minutes each, and hopefully um, this will give you a clue as to where we're going as we move to the American Revolution. So France was in the New World. They were in four wars in Europe between 1688 and 1763, so they were spread kind of thin. They were involved in nine world wars, and um, whenever the colonies, whenever mainland Europe was in uh, a war, the colonies were always drawn into it, all the colonies around the world. So any war that the that Britain or France or Spain, any of those mother countries, if they were involved in a war around the world, the colonies were drawn into it. So this was not a good thing for any colonist. Um, so the Seven Years' War is also what we call the French and Indian War. Seven Years' War, it was called in Europe. So there were two different names for it. Um, we just call it the French and Indian War, but it was actually a world war. It was not just between the French, the Indians, and the Great Brit the, the British in America. This was a much more global war. So France um, was late to the New World like England was. Spain had gotten there first, and France and England showed up a little bit later. Um, France more so for trading and uh, missionary purposes. Um, British were there to make money and for religious freedom. So you have this edict in 1598 which uh, gives limited religious toleration to French Protestants um, and so people are kinda happy and France because before it had been a, a Catholic country only. So before you have France blossoms in the early 1600s because there weren't any real wars going on and it becomes the biggest most feared country in, in Europe. Britain, remember, the British Empire had not yet really become uh, a viable um, empire at this point because they had not moved into the New World. They were still um, contained basically on their island. So you have King Louis the Fourteenth and his friends, and he was in charge of France for 72 years from the age of five, and he was most interested in overseas colonizations, colonization. When you have a king who's on the throne for that many years, is a great, usually stability. Um, people kind of know what to expect from him. Their first settlement was at. Quebec in 1608, Samuel de Champlain was considered the father of New France. This is just an image of him. Um, they had good relations with the Huron Indian tribes of the upper Midwest, Michigan, all in the Great Lakes region. Um, the Native Americans, they helped each other out. The French and the Native Americans helped each other out, so um, it was a good deal. The French were not so arrogant and so domineering as the British were, and so um, the the after uh, the British get involved, things change a great deal. Uh, just one more power to consider, um, and they complicate things. New France is got controlled by the king after these commercial companies fail and the king rules with an iron fist, or an iron thumb, or whatever, an iron fist. And so they don't have any representative assemblies like the British do. They don't have any rights to a jury trial. And by 1750, there are only 60,000 people living in New France. The British, by 1750, have thousands and thousands and thousands living in their 13 colonies. So the French at home are pretty happy. They're not, um, they're not so... Um, excited or, you know, they're not dying to come to the New World like the people in Britain are. Things aren't quite so bad in France as they are in Britain. Protestant Huguenots are denied refuge in the colony, so they don't really want to come, so it's only Catholics. And uh, France likes the sugar colonies of the Caribbean because they can make more money. 
Um, these are just images of beaver furs here. They're hanging. And this is a beaver pelt hat. Um, they were fashionable in Europe, beaver uh, clothing made out of beaver furs. And so they, um, beaver skins, that was a great market there. Um, the traders um, were free to be you and me, so to speak. They were um, two-fisted drinkers, meaning they had a drink in each hand. They were partiers, and so these traders, you know, um, had a good, pretty good deal going on, and the Native Americans did too. It was a mutually, uh, uh, a mutually beneficial relationship. So the Indians were recruited to help them out, uh, and the French. And so they have people in 400 canoes that show up at Montreal in 1693. Um, the Native Americans here, just like in Spanish uh, America, and um, were decimated by disease. They were ruined by alcoholism that they traded with the Europeans. Um, and basically, European contact weakened the traditional Indian culture, their way of life. And basically, they ruined the beaver population and that ruination of the beaver population damages the ecosystem of the area. The missionaries were Jesuits, uh, an order of Catholic monks, and are missionaries, and they um, wanted to save Indians for Christ and to save them from the fur traders. Um, they weren't too successful in converting these Native Americans. Um, they were and the question is why? Well, the, the Native Americans didn't really have a real incentive. They had their own religion, and so anytime you have these people arbitrarily coming in and saying, you should worship our God, well, these people were kind of skeptical of that. And so they, you know, they might have gone along with it in order to, you know, do the trading and to make money or to get what they wanted, but the true conversion was rare. Um... But the Native Americans were also very helpful for the French as geographers and explorers. So because they knew the area and they could they could translate, they could um, help them the French figure out where they needed to go um, and how things worked. You had Antoine Cadillac who founded Detroit. Notice the name Cadillac and Detroit with cars um, to stop the English from colonizing in 1701 so he founds detroit la salle claims the had claimed the mississippi river for france in 1682 all the way from the great lakes to the gulf and they put fortified post in mississippi and louisiana to control this river and to block spain from using it and they also put put a post at new orleans in 1718 so they floated the grain that they had down the river for shipment to the West Indies and to Europe. So the French were very industrious, and they were using the things that were available to them to make money, beaver skins, the river, those kinds of things. So we had talked about earlier King William's War and Queen Anne's War, and these conflicts are, deal with the British and the French on both sides, and they're both recruiting Indian allies, which is foretelling because of the um, French and Indian War that happens in beginning in 1754. There was not really any support for these two wars at home, and so they used guerrilla warfare that they had learned from the Indians. So this is a departure because the army armies in Europe are trained in the open field, face-to-face um, -face combat without um, you, you face your enemies head-on and you know, use bayonets. You don't hide behind a tree and, you know, blow him away with a gun or uh, hit them with an arrow or an axe or whatever, a hatchet. Uh, you meet them in the field face to face. So this is going to be important for the French and Indian War and for the American Revolution because this is such a departure for the British so soldiers and the French too. Uh, that will be fighting this war. The French allies and the French Indian allies torch British settlements on the frontier, such as at Deerfield, Massachusetts. And um, this was a huge, they did away with uh, this community basically 
They killed women, children. They didn't. It didn't matter. Um, with Spain allies with France, and then they antagonized the people in South Carolina, which in turn um, makes the people in England nervous because South Carolinians uh, play such an economic role. This is into the 18th century. I had to see where we were going with this. Okay, how much time I have. Just a few minutes and then we'll do another one. I'll start again. Okay, so Britain, we talked about salutary neglect last week, and they also have limited trading rights with Spanish America, which causes friction because colonists are smuggling. Um, the War of Jenkins' Ears, the Brits versus the Spaniards off on St. Simon's Island, off the Georgia coast and in the Caribbean Sea. Um, so you have all of these um, different small skirmishes or wars, as they're called, and um, England ends up invading New France at Louisbourg, which is now in Canada, to, in present-day Canada. This peace treaty in 1748 gives Louisbourg back to the French. Well, the American colonists had put in a whole bunch of, of had contributed a lot of troops to the battle that wins Louisbourg for the British. And so the British in hammering out this particular treaty um, in 1748, the British just give back Louisbourg. They give it back to the French. And so the colonies are still threatened by the French in what is now present-day Canada. And so the Fran France is still hanging out with them in the colonies right, you know, uh, just north of Maine, basically. And so they are, um, the, the colonists are absolutely livid because they had contributed so much to the, um, the battle that won Lewisburg for Britain, and they were so proud of themselves. So you have George Washington, and we're now at the French and Indian War in 1754. So you have to look at this map. These are the 13 colonies. The little um, ankles are the Appalachian Mountains. Okay, so people are not, this is basically New France. So you see how landlocked the British colonies are. They are locked along the eastern seaboard. They have Spanish Florida here, and then all of this yellow area is French territory. So um, obviously the British aren't going very far um, at this point. Um, it, you have to remember too, this is Williamsburg, so this is where the Virginia governor, Robert Dinwiddie, would be living. Robert Dinwiddie is an investor in the Ohio Valley Company. George Washington is also an investor in the Ohio Valley Company. This is the Ohio Valley. It is now in French hands. So the governor sends 21-year-old George Washington, who is a surveyor. He has no formal education. He has no military experience, but he is an investor in this company. And there are several... Um, let me look at this a minute. 